for those uh, who have not attended one of our caucus events before, welcome. And for the rest of you, it's nice to see you again. Glad you're here. As many of you know, the focus of this caucus is to increase awareness and education on the protection of rights and identity of all ethnicities and religions in Sri Lanka who are being excluded from society, uh, the economy, and political life through discrimination, harassment, and persecution. Since we started the caucus back in 2013, uh, some progress has been made to increase the, uh, democratic principles and restore human rights of all Sri Lankans, notably due to the election of the Sirisena government in 2015. However, as we will hear from our speakers today, there's considerable work that must be done before those rights are fully restored. Work which the Sirisena government has committed to accomplish by co-sponsoring Resolution 30-1 of the UN Human Rights Council. Let me now turn it over to my, uh, my good friend Danny Davis uh, for his opening remarks, and then I'll introduce our, uh, our great panel speakers today. Danny? All right. Thank you very much, and uh, I too want to welcome all of those who have come. But even before that, I want to commend you for taking on the leadership of this effort and of this caucus. People often wonder us, wonder and ask us, why are you involved with this? Why are you involved with that? And oftentimes they look for an individual to spend most of their time relative to something related to their ethnicity, something related to their background, or something related to a big population that they might interact with on a regular and ongoing basis. And when you took on the leadership of this effort, I don't think you fit any of that. <laughs> I mean, All you got to do is look at me, Danny, you figure that out. <laughs> I, I really don't. But yet, because of your interest in human rights and the rights of all, I have a little thing that I often say about rights. That is, my rights end by the next person's rights begin. My mother used to tell us that right is right if nobody is right. And wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. She had no real philosophical background other than that which was given to her by virtue of being a citizen and a person born in a free democratic society. And I think she passed some of that on to at least one of her children. Uh, that being me. <laughs> and I fit the same category, I think as Bill does, in terms of hoping to see all individuals, no matter where they are, as a part of this world, experience the highest level and a degree of rights that our society can afford anyone. I think I had about five people in my congressional district from Sri Lanka when they first introduced me. And we actually, they lived in a little village called uh, Rockville. And of course, the mayor didn't know what was happening there. And they, they organized an event at City Hall. And we all went to his little City Hall. He really didn't know what was going on, especially as they gave us robes and other kinds of things, drapes, and put a lot of paraphernalia around our shoulders. He didn't know what was going on. I knew a little bit more than he did. So he called me over to the side. He said, yeah, I didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. I said, yeah, Mr. Mayor, I kind of know. That was my beginning of having relationships with individuals whose ethnic background had brought them from Sri Lanka to Chicago, Illinois. And then, of course, I met other people who were just as passionate as they could be. And so 
So we've been making little bits and pieces of progress. Bits and pieces of progress. Sometimes we ask when there's going to be a breakthrough. But I remember a black guy who had some philosophical things to say, and he said that freedom is a hard one thing. Each generation has to win it and win the game. And so you never stop. You never give up. If you want to make a trip down to Arkansas where I grew up, you go south. And every time you make a step, you get a little bit closer. And so every time we make a step, we get a little bit closer to you. I commend you, congratulate you, enjoy working with you, and thank you so much. Danny and I uh, uh, share a lot of things in common. I'm not going to go into all of them today, but we know, uh, we know the grief that comes with loss. And, uh, and I think that gives us a, uh, an extra touch of, uh, of, of grace and mercy, if you will, when we look at the human rights of other human beings. And it's what attracts us to, to do this work. Danny, thank you for those very kind words. I appreciate it very much. Um, today we're going to, uh, to hear from three very distinguished speakers on the progress made on transitional justice in Sri Lanka. Uh, first, we'll hear from John Sifton, who is the Asian Advocacy Director from Human Rights Watch, focusing on South and Southeast Asia. Previously, he was the Director of One World Research, a public interest research and investigation firm. Before joining One World Research, John spent six years at Human Rights Watch, First as a researcher in the Asia Division, focusing on Afghanistan and Pakistan, then as the senior researcher on terrorism and counterterrorism. He holds a law degree from New York University and a bachelor's degree from St. John's College, Annapolis. John has spoken at a couple of our PACS caucus events, so John, thank you for joining us here again today. Then we have Ambassador Stephen Rapp. Next, uh, uh, who served as ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the Office of Global Criminal Justice from 2009 to 2015. He has worked on promoting justice and accountability across the globe for over two decades. Prior to his appointment, Ambassador Rapp served as prosecutor of the Special Court for, for Sierra Leone, beginning in January 2007, Senior Trial Attorney and Chief, Prosecution, Chief of Prosecutions at the International Criminal Tribunal for, Tribunal for Rwanda from 2001 to 2007, and United States Attorney in the Northern District of Iowa from 1993 to 2001. Ambassador Rapp is currently a Distinguished Fellow at the Hague Institute for Global Justice and a Global Prevention Fellow at the Simon, and I don't have an Scott. idea how to pronounce it. Scott. Okay, I'll let you tell me okay. The Center for Prevention of Genocide. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Rapp, for making the effort to speak today while you're uh, here in town. Next, we'll hear from J.S. Tissa Inagwan. Have I got that right? Close is that enough. close? <laughs> close enough. Thank you. Okay, close, close enough. Uh, Johnson is just so easy. Davis <laughs> is just so easy. I apologize if I butchered your name. But Tisa, we're going to go with for sure, is a journalist who worked in English language national newspapers in Sri Lanka for over 25 years. As you may know, Tisa was arrested in 2008 for writing critically of the Sri Lankan government and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. What sacrifice, what commitment. Fortunately, due to an international campaign, he was released after two years. Upon his release in 2010, Tisa moved to the United States and became a Neiman Fellow at Harvard and a Reagan Faskell Fellow 
at the National Endowment for Democracy. He now edits the Peter Mackler Media Freedom Blog on International Freedom of Expression and Information Studies or Information Issues and contributes regularly to Global Post, The Diplomat, and Asian Correspondent. Tisa has also participated in uh, and attended several of our caucus events. Tisa, thank you so much for being here. You would think after as many times as we've met, I'd have your name down. I think Tisa is, is easier. Uh, so I appreciate your, your indulgence. Thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. So with that, let me turn it over. Uh, John, you go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as the least illustrative, I feel I'll go quickest in, the, in my presentation. I wanted to give a quick briefing on the background of the political situation in Sri Lanka, but also in Geneva and here in Washington. Uh, Human Rights Watch's expertise on all of this is really just the fact-finding on the ground and then our capacity to politically harangue and harass political actors, whether here in Washington or wherever else, to do what they ought to do. But the hard work of actually holding people accountable for crimes that occurred in Sri Lanka over the Civil War and even now, um, th that's not our work. I mean, that's not even my expertise, and I feel like Ambassador Rapp is much more qualified to talk about the actual logistical and practical complications of holding people accountable, which is something you've actually done in your life. Uh, so here's my quick overview. I mean, look, let's, let's be honest about the situation in Sri Lanka. There's no denying that since the Sirisena government was elected, we have a better human rights situation. I mean, the current government is a vast improvement over the last one. It made huge progress in a number of areas. But it would be somewhat misplaced to applaud the government too much for not being authoritarian, not disappearing people, not torturing them, not shuttering newspapers, because after all, governments aren't supposed to do those things. So uh, applauding them for that is a little bit misplaced. But we can take note of some of the very important steps that have been taken, even though they're only small steps. And I, and I just want to give a quick overview of those steps. We, I think many of us know there are these uh, four key pillars to addressing past war crimes and other abuses that took place during Sri Lanka's civil war, and in particular in the last year of the war in 2009. And those pillars, roughly speaking, in no particular order, are A, the setting up of um, a mechanism to deal with missing persons, the Office of Missing Persons mechanism. Two, some kind of special court being set up to address crimes that occurred during the Civil War. Three, some kind of truth-telling mechanism, truth commission mechanism. Um, and fourth, the mechanism of non-recurrence, which includes issues of reparations. Now, there have been some steps taken forward, in particular, on the Office of Min Missing Persons mechanism and on the Special Court, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. The last two, um, there's been some draft legislation, but uh, fewer steps. Uh, if, I, if our team had to make one complaint about what's been going on in the last um, year or so in Sri Lanka, it's been that momentum has been lost. Um, th there have been steps taken forward, but a lot of the momentum towards setting up these mechanisms has been flagging. And in particular, in the last few months, uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, inertia. And we expect that the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights report that will report on these progress will, will say just that when uh, next week the UN Human Rights Council sessions begin and start to address the situation in Sri Lanka. I mean, look, the current government has been very good at international outreach. They've been very good at talking to foreign diplomats about what they're doing. Um, and special mandate holders from the UN have, have visited over the last 18 months, and many foreign delegations almost every week have come from various governments. Uh, the International Crisis Group, which has been very active, were able to hold their annual retreat in Sri Lanka, which, when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, is kind of extraordinary. And even Amnesty International has been in talks with the government about setting up a regional hub in, in Colombo. And that's, those are all remarkable facts. Uh, the March session of the Human Rights Council, many people expect the resolution um, will simply be a rollover resolution that will renew the mandate uh, that was in the old resolutions. But we actually were hoping for something that would be a little stronger 
um, asking uh, for language that would express concern about some of the inertia that's going on. So let me talk about that, this inertia. Let's start with the special court mechanism. I mean, look, there, there were public consultations nationwide, and many people were consulted in the North and the South about what they would like to see in a special court and in, in an accountability mechanism. And that was all for the good. There was a slight variation in some of the things we heard from uh, local folks involved in the consultations. In the North, uh, the task force heard more that people wanted a special court with international involvement that included uh, a strong international role in the actual process of the court. In the South, it was more that international involvement was welcome, but it was more on a technical <coughs> basis, investigatory, and forensic. Uh, but everybody agreed that international participation was necessary, either because the government lacked expertise relevant or independence, and that there was a lack of trust there in the government. So that happens. That's real. Those consultations occurred. But now the next step is, is we see some inertia. And recent statements by the government, especially in the wake of uh, the new administration here in Washington, have suggested that President Sirisina, um doesn't think that following through on this um, is a priority, and we're, we're getting concerned about that. Moving on to Office of uh, Missing Persons, um, I mean, we can give credit to the government for passing legislation to set up a quote-unquote Office of Missing Persons, but uh, it did so without the same amount of consultation you saw with the special court consultations, and there was a lot of, um, there was a fair amount of complaint about that, the lack of limited, the lack of feedback, um, and it seemed like it was all geared towards sort of public consumption and not a real desire to set up an office of missing persons anytime soon. And we don't need, actually see any signs that the government is moving towards setting up an office of missing persons anytime soon. So that's a little bit of a complaint. On truth-seeking and reconciliation and reparations, we hear about draft legislation. We at Human Rights Watch haven't seen it. Um, we've heard that there, the draft legislation, uh, there's some solid documents, but... Um, we don't know a lot about it, and we'd like to see more of it. Our biggest concern is that the government talks a lot about sequencing of all these mechanisms and puts the special court at the end, Office of Missing Persons sort of in the middle, these other things up front. And while we understand the argument that you can't do everything at once and there's limited bandwidth, and that setting up a special court too quickly might set off political sensitivities, we feel like the sequencing discussion, this talk that the government sort of says, we have to take it slow, do things one thing at a time, is only, in some cases, an excuse. It's a pretext that it's a little bit disingenuous. So rather concerned about that. And um, since, since the new administration took office here in Washington, um, our concerns have only grown because of public statements by the government suggesting that they hope the new administration here in Washington is going to have less pressure on the government of Sri Lanka to meet these um, promises that they've made in previous Geneva events. Um, I'm not going to go through all the legal reforms that have been going on, except to say, independent of accountability, the PTA, the um, terrorism law, remains in the book. And while we don't see the use being anywhere as bad as it was, the prevention of terrorism, um, its, it's use is not as abusive as in, previous, as in the previous government. It's still being used, and there, there were arrests under it last, uh, last year, and that remains a concern. The government has ceded and ratified the Convention on the Protection of All Persons of Enforced Disappearances, the Disappearances Convention. That's good news. There's implementing legislation, and we give credit for that. And, um, but there are also uh, promises on legal reforms on other areas outside of accountability that have flagged, and we have a lot of concerns about that. Politically, and this is where I'll end, our concern now is that the new administration here in Washington will not be as vigorous as the previous one in pressuring the government of Sri Lanka to meet its previous promises in Geneva. Uh, the UK, the EU, Japan, several other governments have played a very important role at Geneva. I mean, make no mistake, the little progress that has occurred in Sri Lanka has been because of the pressure in Geneva at the Human Rights Council and the resolutions that the international community has pressured Sri Lanka to agree to. And the U.S. has often been a leader in those efforts. Um, 
and we can applaud Ambassador Rapp's efforts on that, as well as the previous uh, staff within the State Department's Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. But now, we don't know what's going to happen, and there is a concern that without strong U.S. leadership, that that pressure in Geneva will flag. There are still many diplomats there who will push, but without the strong leadership of the U.S., you know, there's, in, there's increasing concerns that you'll have a strong resolution. So that means everybody else needs to up their game. Civil society um, has to push in other capitals to get other countries to take up the leadership if the U.S. leadership is, in fact, going to flag. So I'll leave it there. That's my just very broad overview of the situation as a kind of introduction, and maybe we'll get into more detail as we move on. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I guess that's on. Uh, it's, uh, great to be here today, and I, and I really, uh, our, our two members of Congress had to leave, but I, they'll be back. Uh, it, it is so important uh, to have congressional focus uh, on this issue. Uh, Without getting into political issues, having been an appointee of the, of the previous administration, uh, recognize, of course, that we have a permanent government, diplomats, uh, people in my former office like Ari Bassan that are here that are working and engaging uh, on on these issues and uh, and policies that have been adapted and 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 uh, and, and implemented. Um, but of course, uh, we're, we're dealing with a new administration and and leaving aside uh, uh, any. Uh, and any other and unrelated issues, uh, uh, this is one on which we haven't had uh, any real discussion uh, in terms of where the administration will go. And of course, we have relatively inexperienced people uh, like the Secretary of State himself uh, uh, coming in and, and being unfamiliar uh, with with these issues. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that as as, as the administration uh, staffs up, uh, uh, people will look at this and, and realize the, maybe it's the real politic point of view. Uh, but that uh, uh, Sri Lanka depends upon uh, a society, a vibrant society, in which uh, everyone is working together, that's not divided, that doesn't fall back into, into conflict because uh, groups have been marginalized. Uh, the Tamil community, the Muslim community, the Sahala community, et cetera, need to, need to work together. And, uh, and that the process of transitional justice is absolutely essential to that. Uh, there, there are certainly other reasons uh, in terms of our own commitment to justice and human rights and, and, and our partnership uh, with, with people who have suffered in, in, in Sri Lanka. But uh, it, it's good politics for America uh, and, and good for this administration to, to take that position. And, and uh, with bipartisan leadership in the Congress on this issue and on others, I think that uh, uh, in the absence of, of, of yet experienced people, uh, in, in leadership positions in the administration is really the key to success, and that's why I'm so glad to have uh, to be here uh, at, at this briefing, uh, uh, really in only the second month, or really only the first month, I guess, of, of, of the administration and, and the new Congress. Um, I did want to say something about my engagement on, on Sri Lanka, and, uh, and when I came on as ambassador at large, and from my experience uh, in Africa, uh, I was focusing on a lot of African issues, uh, having prosecuted the Rwanda genocide and being dealt with uh, uh, the, the horrible crimes committed in, in Sierra Leone and prosecuting a chief of state there. And, and obviously we had other places like the Democratic Republic of Congo. We had been situations in, in, in North Africa and the Arab world which, uh, which got all of our attention. But uh, um, the Sri Lanka one was, was frankly very important to me because it, at, the, at the international level, uh, I had worked with a great many uh, Sri Lankan jurists uh, when I tried the media trial. So uh, the Guru Wardana was the, was one of the judges. Uh, became friends with uh, others of the judges uh, that, that came out uh, uh, to both of the courts, and, and there were also people that worked within the prosecution. And, and I remember in, in Sierra Leone, um, one of the more challenging things we did was to prosecute the people that fought on the government side <laughs> against the really nasty. Uh, movement called the Revolutionary United, uh, Revolutionary United Front that was famous for chopping off hands and committing other, uh, other atrocities. Uh, and a particular uh, pro-government group fought them, but committed major atrocities in the course of, of, of that fight. And, uh, and some people viewed them as heroes, 
Others recognized that, in fact, those acts had, had created uh, differences with those communities. In fact, it precipitated even worse acts uh, than by that uh, by that group, uh, by the by the by the terrorist group. And so, uh, it was really necessary to have justice in that case. And after a trial in which uh, we, we won, and the, the sentences were too short, I appealed the sentences, and uh, we had a split decision in the appeals chamber, three to two. Uh, the two Sierra Leone judges voted to keep the sentences at a low level. Uh, the Nigerian uh, and, and European judge voted to, to go along with our appeal, and the deciding vote was cast by Raja Fernando, the, 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 the Sri Lankan judge, to increase the sentences against those who fought on the right side, but because of the abuses against the civilian population. So, so uh, uh, seeing courageous judicial leadership like that from, from, Sierra, or from, from in Sierra Leone, but from another SL country, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, certainly inspired me as, as, as I began to engage uh, on this issue uh, being appointed uh, just about three months after the end of the conflict in, in, in 2009. And, uh, and, and always uh, wanted to, to take the approach uh, with, with uh, Sri Lankan authorities that uh, they should do this on their own, that they should uh, find uh, ways to, to move forward with, 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 with justice. And, um, and uh, as, as people remember, the engagement that, that we had, uh, even when we finally went to Geneva in 2012, was to encourage right action by the government. And it was only when we got to 2014 and there had been nothing, uh, or there had been, in fact, an LLRC, not a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but a Lessons Learned and Reconciliation, as if perhaps maybe the truth was not so important, but still a commission that had some positive elements in it. And then those positive elements were, uh, were, were ignored. And, uh, and that's what led us to, to finally move for the, uh, what was called the official uh, uh, inquiry under the leadership of the High Commissioner uh, to investigate uh, the serious violations and uh, human rights and related crimes that occurred at the, at, at the end of the conflict. Of course, since then, uh, we've had uh, uh, an election and, and certainly uh, a representation of the fact that, that, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, Sri Lanka is a, is a democracy, <laughs> indeed, uh, in, in the region in terms of, of, of universal suffrage, I think has, has had it longer than, than any other uh, country uh, in, in the region. And, uh, and, and, and elections are conducted honestly, and, and the public, uh, I thought, reacted from, from the overreach uh, of, of, the, of the previous uh, administration uh, in, in so many ways, and, and did it twice in the election of the president. Uh, that, that, that surprised the, the world in early 2015 and then later in the, in, in the legislative uh, uh, elections. And so uh, it, it certainly gave us hope. And then uh, uh, just as, as I was departing the position, we had uh, the engagement in, in, in Geneva, the, my position as, as ambassador at large. It was, I left in August, and, the, and the, the Human Rights Council met on the question of the official inquiry in September of 2015, and we had this resolution 30-1, uh, in which the government, uh, uh, you know, made certain undertakings. It was the unanimous resolution with the support uh, of, uh, of, of the government of, of, of Sri Lanka, uh, included these elements that, uh, that John has, has described, and, uh, and included uh, uh, amongst them some very uh, substantive things, uh, such as uh, the need for this court, uh, this uh, one of the elements is the establishment of a, of, of a special court, but that that court would, uh, would include uh, international uh, judges. And, uh, and so we had this commitment uh, from the government, and, and that is now, uh, as, as we look at it, coming up into March of 2017, uh, a year and a half ago. And, and I know in other situations it may take time, but there's also uh, there's also uh, the danger, uh, and I mean, people who are opposing this uh, think that by dragging it out, one can reduce the pressures, and, and, it, and, and each step becomes much, much more difficult uh, to implement. And so I'd have to say, and, I, and I've said publicly before, that, I, that I'm really disappointed uh, in, in the slowness of, of the action on, on these questions. Now, one of the things that's been extremely positive uh, in uh, to date, and uh, had a chance to, to read uh, uh, at least large parts of the of the consultation task force report that was issued in, in, in early January. And uh, I mean, as 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 they discuss, uh, and, I, and I and I see some people in the in the sort of more uh, uh, biased press or you know, 
saying the 7,306 consultations wasn't enough, et cetera, but, uh, but they did uh, a, a survey around the country. There were differences, et cetera, but uh, as, as John said, there were, were strong support uh, for, for at least having, uh, that having international judges and having at least one on every single panel. Uh, some would say they need a majority, more than one, but, but obviously the, the benefits of, of having the independence uh, that, uh, that that brings and the kind of assurance that it brings to those that might not uh, think their cause welcome there uh, is, uh, is valuable in, in, in having a, a single one. But I mean, there were some, some really tremendous insights uh, in, in this, this report, and, uh, and, and there are things that, that all of us have, have felt uh, as we as we've dealt with uh, Sri Lanka in the past, and, and to hear them uh, reflected uh, from something established by the government that polled the people of the of the country, north, south, uh, east, and west. But uh, uh, the first of it is that you need uh, for this transitional justice uh, advocacy and championship at the highest levels of the government, and, and that is frankly what has been lacking. And, uh, uh, it, it reminded me a little of the a sort of even the limp approach to the LLRC report that was delivered to, to, to Mahinda. You know, you, just, you know, and then it, it was that was uh, nowhere near as tough as this. And then you, you, you thought it never it had never been filed. Uh, we haven't heard anything in, in, in regard to this. And then uh, something that I think all of us feel so passionately <laughs> from having dealt with the history of, of this situation. Uh, and, and having talked to, to the victims and, and survivors, and of course, this wasn't just dealing with the victims and survivors of, of not just, but of the, of the conflict in the North, but also of, uh, of, of um, abuses and violations that, that occurred in the, in the 1980s. Uh, but uh, as they say, in, in a sort of second uh, overarching uh, observation, people throughout the country expressed frustration, bitterness, and anger at yet another initiative, despite the inconclusive nature and abysmal failure of past efforts to provide any relief or redress. It reminded me of before the end of the conflict when we had this international we had a commission of inquiry and then an international group of eminent persons advising them, and then, and then they uh, basically suppressed the report of the inquiry commission and these international eminent persons all resigned. Then we had an LLRC report that was sort of uh, was, was ignored or transmuted into a national action plan, and now do, do, we, uh, do we have the, the, the same thing? And, and then I think the fundamental uh, point, which uh, is in the overarching um, uh, observations, is one needs unequivocal action by the government to prevent the spread of ethnic division and religious intolerance and hold to account those responsible under due process of law without fear or favor. And, and that is so essential, as is later pointed out uh, uh, in this, that a key impediment uh, to reconciliation uh, is impunity. And there are always those in dealing with these sort of transitional justice things that say, hey, let's, uh, let's skip the truth part. <laughs> let's skip the justice part. Let's go straight to the reconciliation part. Okay, everybody's going to get along, right? Uh, bygones be bygones, turn the page, et cetera. And, and that does not work. And, and even in, in countries that have foregone a lot of prosecutions, like South Africa, for people to have to, to truly uh, go through that process required a very cathartic effort in which the different sides came forth and confessed to their crimes and applied uh, for, for relief from punishment. And only about 10% of those that applied got it for making a clean breast of uh, and, and And so it was possible, even in that context, which... Uh, Maybe a more difficult, given the development of international law, to completely forgive the most serious offenders. But, but, but there was something. So you can't avoid that. And I and I see even like a, a senior former leader saying, "Well, let's go right to reconciliation." This does not, uh, it doesn't work. It has to be based on truth. It has to be based uh, on, on on fair fair processes. There are things, of course, that disturb me uh, greatly, and 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 knowing. Sri Lanka and knowing judges and, and others uh, and, and knowing how uh, uh, there can be within states forces that are very hard to control and to discipline and to take acts against, uh, there, there are still disappointing aspects of, of, of ongoing conduct that disturb me. Uh, I, I work very closely with, um, with Yasmin Suka, a great South African um, 
head of the National Human Rights Institute in, in South Africa, member of the famous Truth and Reconciliation Commission in, in South Africa, later uh, in, 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 um, in, in uh, Sierra Leone, and currently chairing the International uh, Human Rights Commission, which will report also at the, in, in Geneva uh, on uh, South Sudan. And, but she also heads a, uh, an, uh, an organization called the International Center for Truth and Justice in regard to, to Sri Lanka. And I've, I've met uh, with her, I've met with uh, survivors uh, of, of torture and sexual violence um, that, uh, that she, her, they've identified, people largely who have been able to escape uh, Sri Lanka, uh, seen people in, that I interviewed in London in, in June uh, uh, with, with, with fresh bloody scars of, of, of torture that they'd received in, in Sri Lanka only a couple of weeks beforehand, uh, talked to women who were, uh, who were raped uh, uh, by the security services and had to be bribed by their, by their, uh, by their family members. Uh, you've probably seen their report they issued, they issued a few, uh, about three weeks ago uh, to the uh, uh, Commission on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, documenting 55 cases of sexual violence, 48 during the previous regime, seven uh, at, uh, at present. Uh, and uh, uh, what the, my message on these is my message was in my previous trips when I saw people in the, in the Attorney General's office, some of whom, uh, a couple of whom were my former colleagues from international justice, you know, you need to proceed and, 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 and win some cases and, and send some message, a message that people aren't going to get away with this. Uh, and, and there, you know, we recently had uh, uh, this, this case involving the assassination of a, of a, of a deputy, a 10-year-old case, and, and the way in which that was handled, uh, even though it was filed under the PTA, and we'd like to see the PTA re reformed, uh, uh, but uh, uh, under the law, wouldn't have had a jury trial, but they ordered a jury trial in his case. Uh, jury trials uh, uh, something we believe in strongly in America, but but have to be done very carefully to make sure that your your, your panels uh, are broadly representative of of, 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 the, of of the community, and of course, resulted despite what um, the prosecution thought was strong evidence in in, in, in acquittals. Um, but this, of course, emphasizes also the importance of having uh, victim protection. Uh, I remember when I was there in, in 2014, uh, uh, engaging with Ra uh, Raif, uh, Raif Hakim. Uh, the, uh, the justice minister from the Muslim community, uh, viewed as one of the more correct progressive members of the, of the Rajapaksa administration as they were moving forward with witness protection and, and having met so many victims in, in, outside of, of Sri Lanka that were afraid that if they came back they'd end up in a white van, uh, uh, and having just met the Attorney General's department who said that if they were going to make progress on the uh, Trinco 5 case or the ACF uh, 17 case, they needed witnesses from abroad, and I talked to the, to the French who said that they were prepared to set up a video link. I said, here, we've got an answer, and, uh, and I asked them, says, did the witness protection bill provide for video link testimony? Oh, no, not that. They can testify from anywhere in Sri Lanka. Well, that's not going to do. And then if you have a witness protection authority like we have now, which has some people of, of, who've been involved uh, potentially with abuses in the past, I think no one would have confidence to believe that they would be protected. And so uh, a lot more needs to be done about justice uh, uh, in, in strengthening it uh, if, if we're going to, if going to succeed. Uh, one of the things that would be a very important step, and, and we've seen the need for this recently at the, at the international level, uh, the, the hybrid court or the court approach includes two elements. It includes the court, the judges, but it also includes an office of special counsel. And, uh, and this, it's envisioned that this could also include uh, internationals. Increasingly, uh, we're recognizing that when we form courts at the international level, uh, or even hybrid or mixed courts at the national level, as in the case of the special penal court in the Central African Republic, truly a challenging place to set up a court, um, and, a, and a very divided society, and, 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 and currently, uh, according to surveys, the most dangerous country uh, in, in the world, uh, the setting up, the, the plan for setting up that course first establishes the prosecution, uh, first establishes any judges that may be necessary for granting warrants or, or uh, uh, supervising uh, in investigations. Uh, you don't need to go and have an appeals court, you know, or, or a lot of the whole structure uh, on, on, on day one. Indeed, those people are going to end up uh, not doing any work for their money. 
And so what they really should be doing is setting up the Office of Special Counsel right now and, and start building these cases and start reaching out to, uh, uh, to, to victims outside the country and, 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 and working uh, uh, within the country and working then to, to strengthen and, and make independent uh, victim protection and offer and propose legislation, as I would do as, uh, uh, when, when I was an international prosecutor to the plenary of the judges or as a, as a representative of the Department of Justice uh, to uh, the Congress if we needed reforms in our law to be able to, to more adequately reflect, um, protect uh, uh, witnesses. And so that's what's, what's needed, uh, you know, immediately. And if, if one could see that kind of action, I would, uh, I would have a whole lot more faith that we were going to, to, to see, uh, see action. Um, I understand uh, we need to work closely with the government. We need to work with the good people that, uh, that want to see progress in these areas. We know the profound resistance. I think it's going to continue to require uh, the intense engagement of the, of the international community. Uh, I hope the resolution, which is, is passed in Geneva, will not be one that just is a placeholder and repeats what's in there already, uh, but will be asking for, for steps, uh, concrete steps, to be taken uh, on, on each of these things uh, before the Human Rights Council uh, and, you know, have the High Commissioner report again in June, uh, at least orally, uh, and, and then again next September uh, on, the, on the progress. But really expect to see some action here, otherwise I think uh, uh, people are justifiably concerned that, that we could end up uh, uh, with, with really the unfulfilled promises that created uh, frustration, uh, bitterness, and, and anger in the past, and we'll miss the opportunity to have true reconciliation uh, uh, and, uh, and a greater and stronger uh, uh, Sri Lanka uh, in the world. So thanks uh, for, for listening to all of this, and uh, let's, uh, let me turn it over to Tisa. Uh, thank you. Uh, and good afternoon. Let me start off by thanking Congressman Bill Johnson and Danny Davis for their continuing interest in co-chairing the caucus on ethnic and religious freedom in Sri Lanka and for inviting me to speak today. I would like to take this opportunity to speak about initiatives in Sri Lanka to pass a new constitution. It is important that we address this issue. This is because the 2015 UN Human Rights Council Resolution 31, 30 stroke 1, that lays out transitional justice mechanisms for accountability also speaks about a political settlement through constitutional measures. In the next few minutes, I will try to lay out arguments on three matters. A, that the proposed new constitution will not satisfy even the minimum requirements of the Tamil people and therefore would not solve the root cause of Sri Lanka's conflict. B, the persistence of a root conflict will mean that there will be continuing instability in the country. And C, that it is important that the U.S. takes cognizance of the continuing instability and change its current policy towards Sri Lanka. This is despite the fact that there is a new administration that is here, and I understand that, that there are certain changes that will have to take place, but I think this policy has to change. The root cause of Sri Lanka's national conflict has been drawbacks in power sharing between the Sinhalese, the Tamils and the Muslims from the time of independence in 1948. Asymmetric distribution of power resulted in systemic discrimination and human rights violations. And a key element fueling this problem has been the country's three constitutions starting from 1948. An important campaign promise of President Maitripala Sirisena for the January 2015 presidential election was a new constitution. It would, he promised, benefit all Sri Lankans. However, over the past two years, President Sirisena and his national unity government have stonewalled against backing a demand for a federal constitution that the Tamils have put forward. Now for some background. Demands for a new constitution did not come with President Sirisena's election manifesto. Ever since it was promulgated in 1978, Sri Lanka's third constitution has been a subject of much controversy because it centralized power in an executive president. So two principal challenges emerged. The, worst, the first was from Sri Lankan liberals and progressives. To combat centralization, they demanded better separation of powers in a more robust parliament and judiciary. They were not against power sharing per se, 
because that too was a check on the executive. But power sharing was not a priority. The other challenge came from the Tamils and Muslims. Unlike the liberals who located the main enemy in the office of the presidency, their enemy was the singular ruling class. Because whatever the form of government, presidential or parliamentary, or whichever political party was in power, Sinhalese majorities ensured that elected officials supported by Sinhalese controlled judiciaries and public service crafted and implemented policies discriminatory to of Tamils and Muslims. With the singular political class dominating central government institutions in Colombo, the only effective check for Tamils was federal power sharing, where the provincial assemblies could have greater control of their internal affairs. The call for a federal constitution has been reiterated by Tamil parties from 1949. The most recent, of course, has been the election manifesto of the Tamil National Alliance leading up to the August 2015 general election. However, the attempt has not been a success. Despite valiant attempts by Tamils to carve out greater provincial autonomy for themselves for almost 70 years, all constitutions to date have remained unitary, although the current one allows limited devolution of power to the provinces, which the central government can appropriate back, uh, that Sri Lanka's parliament can appropriate with minimal fuss. There are three sets of problems I would like to cite which makes you believe that the new constitution is unlikely to satisfy even the minimal Tamil demands for power sharing. One, as I said earlier, historically Tamil demands for power sharing has been rejected by singular leaders. When Sri Lanka's first constitution was being drafted in the 1940s, Tamils demanded consociation arrangements in a parliament to form a government. But that was rejected. <coughs> demands for a quasi-federal state when the second constitution was being drafted in 1972, was also rejected by the Constituent Assembly, leading the principal Tamil party to leave the Constituent Assembly. In 1978, when the present and third constitution was being drafted, Tamil parliamentarians boycotted proceedings at the Parliamentary Select Committee because although the singular leadership accepted the Tamil's grievances, they were unwilling to address them. Two, when the ongoing draft constitution drafting process began in 2016. The Constitu Constitutional Assembly appointed six subcommittees to report to it on different aspects of the constitution. The, the, the most important of these reports to us, or to this meeting today, is the report on the subcommittee on center-periphery relations. This subcommittee, while acknowledging that devolution under the current unitary constitution was inadequate, proposed reducing powers of the provincial governor among its main solutions. Under the present system, the governor, who is appointed by the president, is not an elected official, he, but he controls the, the province's finance, public service, and plan. While reducing the powers of the governor is important, it still does not give the people of the province and their elected representatives the, the autonomy needed to set goals or create plans while of course keeping within the broad national parameters, which is the basic, which is basic to any federal constitution. Three, the rhetoric emanating from the government roundly rejects the federal constitution. Both President Sirisena and Prime Minister Vikram Singh have, in recent months, denounced a federal constitution. Meanwhile, the Tamil leadership has been equivocal on the subject. The leadership, while reiterating frequently that Tamils need a federal constitution, strikes up another chord on certain other occasions. The denunciation of Tamil demands by the, by the President and Prime Minister and the equivocation by the Tamil leadership leads to all ethnic groups being wary of the proposed new constitution. If the government is sincere about a, about a constitution for the long-term settlement of Sri Lanka's internal conflict, it has to start conversations on federal power sharing rather than rejecting it from the very outset, which it has been doing. Nor should it use, use propaganda and majoritarian politics to force the Tamils to give up that demand. It has to allow for greater dialogue between Tamils, Muslims, and Sinhalese, so that Sri Lankans understand that the new constitution based on a federal power sharing 
is not beneficial only to Tamils but to all peoples living in Sri Lanka. Prevarication by the government on implementing transitional justice and reactive politics by the TNA has begun creating unrest among the Tamils, especially instability among victim communities. Only last week, families of the disappeared in the north who were on hunger strike met with government officials, only to return bitter and frustrated at the lack of sincere progress or sincere response. Right now, residents in another northern village are doing a sit-in to force the military to vacate the land it had illegally appropriated. The insincerity of the government on both accountability and drafting a constitution which does not meet even the minimum requirements of the Tamils will only spike restiveness among the affected populations. Instability in Sri Lanka will be of little use to the US and the international community. It will not help democracy, investment, trade, or long-term joint ventures. But if Sri Lanka's instability has to be reversed, the U.S. has to rethink its policy towards the country followed since the UNHRC Resolution 30 stroke 1. Washington's criticisms of Sri Lanka's backsliding has been muted. Unless the U.S. is willing to set up benchmarks and hold, the Sri, hold Sri Lanka accountable to those benchmarks, both on accountability and long-term political settlement through a new constitution, I feel that even the few gains made in the last few years could very well be reversed. Thank you. Yes. Um, I have to go in a literally two minutes, but um, I'm not the expert that these two are. So it, you guys want to start asking questions. If there's anyone you have directed towards me, I can answer it now, but then I have to leave. Uh, do we expect uh, advocacy from Human Rights Watch in Geneva? Absolutely, but not just us. There are a number of groups that are descending on Geneva right now to do advocacy with the relevant European and uh, U.S. staff who have the pen and are writing the resolution. I think there's an inertia towards a resolution which is a so-called placeholder, but um, that that shouldn't stop any of us from pushing very hard to get more critical language put in that takes the government to task for not taking steps forward and urges them to do so and tells the High Commissioner to report back you know, very soon, if June maybe, you know, uh, if they don't, and you know, create some more political pressure on them. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Caleb Gilchristen. I'm the Congressman Legislative Assistant for Congressman Dan K. Davis. He's not going to be coming back because at this very same time he's at another briefing that he's hosted. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Representative Bill Johnson is at a White House meeting. So I don't think he'll be able to make it back as well. But um, just for a little housekeeping, we'd like to thank our guests for coming. Uh, I'm sure they have pretty busy schedules, so can we please give them a hand? <laughs> We're going to continue the question and answering, so are there any more questions from the audience? Um, <coughs> how would, and, and, and also the rest of these comments, how would you think about framing um, the concept of unwilling or unable? What kind of time frame would you apply if you were advising the High Commissioner to think about um, how much time? To, to give um, the, for the setting up of, of uh, an accountability measure. Well, and, and when you use terms like unwilling and unable, it, it sounds like uh, you know complementarity in the International Criminal Court, uh, which um, in, in which the, the court won't prosecute if the state is carrying a genuine investigation and prosecution forward on, on its own. And that's certainly always to be encouraged, and will then only take the case if uh, if there's an inability or inability or un unwillingness. Uh, of course, we we recognize that um, Sri Lanka is not a state party to the to the ICC, and uh, at, and for a case to go forward, would take a referral of the Security Council, and uh, and uh, given what we've seen uh, with other attempts. Uh, in, 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 in situations of ongoing violence, uh, to have such referrals, I, I think it's unlikely that that's the direction that uh, we 
go or that there wouldn't be uh, uh, countries like China that would, would veto a resolution to save a further case or the situation. But uh, I, I'd rather, um, you know, continue, uh, indeed, at, at, at the end of the day, uh, as, as, as we've always had to recognize, and, and as I recognized early on as someone who understands uh, what you can do with international justice, uh, uh, what happens in, in Sri Lanka is the key. And, and, and working with the political actors and working with the communities there is, is the key. And, and, uh, and, and pressing them, uh, as, as their own consultative report would indicate, to, to do things uh, in the interest of justice and, and, and in the interest of, of their nation uh, and, and in the interests of, of their nation's uh, reputation and relations as a, as a leader in the region and, and, and a global leader. And so I, that's, that's where I think the, you know, uh, so there's not a big stick, to be frank. Uh, I mean, obviously there are countries that could, as the Europeans have done with, uh, G with GSP, um, um, uh, you know, plus and things like that. There's certain incentives that uh, that are there if if, if there's um, um, if, if there's positive a positive action. But uh, I think this is a situation where we have to continue to engage and continue to press and 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 to be uh, uh, to be you know fair and, but but frank uh, with our friends about the need to just to, to see to, to see progress uh, uh, will can there be justice in other places I mean that's what I'm dealing with in Syria and, and, and others I mean there's certainly the possibility that individuals uh, could be prosecuted elsewhere uh, um, under 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 laws that would Allow other states uh, to prosecute uh, if uh, if a perpetrator turned up in their in their territory. There's some possibility of that, certainly. Uh, but 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 fundamentally, we're talking about trying to make progress in, in, in country. Now, uh, the the leaving aside the sort of legal uh, framework of international justice, uh, I, I do think you're you're correct that the High Commissioner does need to to look at these questions of uh, of ability and. And willingness, and and uh, and all of us should look at: are, are there things um, that we can do to assist them, uh, from a technical capacity, to, to do it themselves? And I think, as as uh, as John was saying in regard to the attitude of some about international judges, I do think um, that having international personnel and people that know how to make these cases, uh, particularly prosecutors and investigators working with local people who are very competent and very capable but aren't necessarily familiar with the law or the, 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 the challenging ways in which cases have to be made if you're trying to hold a relatively high-level person to account for something that happens in the field. There are advantages to, to, to working with from a technical standpoint, um, and, and, and I think that's something we should be always willing to, to look at, though as as, as my remarks indicated and as the past history indicated and, and, and because of the political difficulty of this that we, that we recognize, uh, there, uh, there is an issue of will and, and, uh, and sort of uh, and a will to have independent justice, uh, justice in which victims and witnesses are, are protected, in which, uh, in which decisions are made on the facts and on the law and not because of certain pressures, et cetera. So that's a that's, that's a tough part of it, and, and I think one continues going to have to, and rep, special rapporteurs and others that are, that are dealing with things like the independence of the judiciary and, and uh, with, with other, uh, other human rights issues, uh, need to, to engage uh, uh, to make sure that what is, what is done here does give us, a, um, that we do encourage a will to have not a, a window dressing kind of process. We did a few cases, they didn't come, come to much. But, but really something that's, uh, that's independent justice uh, that's, that's, that's in which the courts are, are strong enough uh, and, and independent enough to, to, to do the job that, that people that will cause people to have faith in them, uh, whatever the result of the case is. Uh, well, I think the basic problem here is that there is impunity, impunity that is continuing in the military. And if there is going to be justice, for the, uh, I mean, for the victims, it will mean that the the military has to be prosecuted, and uh, either it it should be a domestic court with foreign judges, which I don't think will do the job, 
but it's much better if it's a properly uh, constituted hybrid coal because without that not very little is going to happen and to my mind the only way that you can do that i mean as ambassador rap says you can you can you can work with the sri lankan authorities you can work with the judiciary and stuff like that but again when there is a lack of will and the fact that impunity makes the sri lankan military continue to con commit atrocities it will mean that pressure has to come on the sri lankan elite especially the political establishment so that gets translated into having to do stuff because if you remember even under the rajapaksa one of the thi one of the things that worked was international pressure so i think like as uh, one thing is gsp plus the other thing is something like the lehi law or something like that which begins to or uh, will like making something like the magnitsky act to sort of work across the board and uh, perhaps not allow sri lankan uh, diplomats or sorry people who are who are in some ways associated or connected with these atrocities to travel things like that will work and also beginning to put pressure on the government saying that unless they carry out i mean under some of these benchmarks that have been set up are met that they are going to have increasing problems unless those uh those concerns are articulated and there is the government of sri lanka realizes that the international community is going to do this or is going to uh implement this you can be pretty sure that they are going to do very little i mean it will be the window dressing that you were talking about that's all so i think more pressure has to come from the international community ali yes sir thank you too very much for speaking to us uh, the former president of pakistan has been mounting a bit of a political comeback as of late he's uh, done this primarily by uh, railing against international interference as well as the chinese investment product uh, projects more attempts to investigate and what kind of might happen how do you see that impacting things going forward for the uh, president to send a force to perhaps concede a little bit and not use a little bit to uh, international efforts to investigate the war do you want to yeah you, you, you speak first I'll be glad to okay. come uh, well i think the, the one of the things that has been happening as i was saying in my presentation was that is that the whole uh reconciliation effort that has been or so called reconciliation effort that has been taking place in sri lanka ever since 2009 has been seen as something where the tamils have to be placated and anything uh, like for instance account both in accountability as well as in a long term solution through a to a Uh, federal constitution is to placate the tamils and when they say that what they try to say is that anything that is done to bring about this reconciliation by giving something or conceding something to the tamils is by virtue of that fact taking something from the singhalese now i don't think that approach is correct because finally accountability and justice is going to bring about a better sri lanka you are going to have a better uh, a more disciplined military you are going to have a more satisfied uh, community a uh, satisfied sri lankan citizen both who are the victims as well as the perpetrators now the whole approach of the government although even the present government has been as i said you take something if you give something to the tamils it's like taking something from the singhalese so it is this particular line of thinking and this messaging that the sri lanka government the present government has been pushing that allows people like rajapaksa to exploit because he comes from the kind of the the extreme from the from the more of the right wing he is a he is a singhala nation so what he tries to say is look i mean these guys are doing something that is against our interest against the interest of the military against the interest of singhala nation if the government of sri lanka is more straightforward 
and says that this is not the way, I mean, if the messaging is different, if it says that this is for all of us. And I'm sure there's a large percentage of people who are quite willing to accept that. Till that happens, you can be pretty sure that the Sri Lanka government, sorry, the, the, the Rajapaksa regime, or the, the Rajapaksa faction of the SLSP and, the, and his followers, will take the upper hand because they can always sort of outflank a singular government by someone like uh, um, uh, Sirisena and, of course, Pranay Vikramasi. Unless the messaging and the, and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the world or the, the, the point of view that the, government, the present government projects changes. So that, I think, is crucial. If that doesn't happen, you can be pretty sure this sort of, uh, you know, the Rajapaksa's present line of attack will continue. And I, you know, commenting on political factors and projecting them in, in, in another country is a difficult thing to do. Uh, I, I, you know, there are certainly in, in a variety of situations uh, uh, groups that, that uh, 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 take the cause of, the, of those that have done the wrong thing. I mean, I see what happens in, in Serbia, uh, the radical party of Sechel coming back. Uh, obviously, some people even associated with the current uh, government of, of, in power. Uh, being quite negative to the kind of accountability that occurred in the past, people that would make war criminals like Mladic and Karadzic into, into heroes rather than uh, to individuals that, that shamed uh, uh, the, the nation. Um, but, uh, I mean, the, the best approach, uh, certainly agree with Tisa, that uh, is, is for the government to take the approach that I think, frankly, won the, the election. Obviously, they, weren't, they didn't win this election by winning 100 percent of the Tamil vote. They got Eighty some percent of it, et cetera. Uh, they won it by getting a very large share of, of, the, of the vote in the, in the South, et cetera. And there was a, a, a feeling that, uh, I mean, at least as I read it, and I, know, I guess one has to look at exit polls and things like that, but, but certainly a feeling that uh, the country was estranging itself from its natural friends uh, in the West, uh, going down the China direction, and indeed making these. Uh, these deals, like in the president's hometown, for this harbor, massive and expensive debt-driven uh, kind of projects, et cetera, and that, and that the sort of constitutional grab, the, the continuing strengthening of the executive presidency, wasn't what people wanted. And there were, of course, attacks on the independence of the judiciary, actions against uh, Sinhala jurists and others that, that caused the bar and, and, and others to react. And, and I think uh, people need to be reminded of of that kind of abuse of power and that sort of use of the ethnic or the sectarian card, which is always the, the sort of the, the last refuge of scoundrels, <laughs> to be frank, uh, in, in every political system, uh, us against us against them, and to say no, it's it's us together uh, as, as 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 Sri Lankans and uh, us as a, a, as part of the world, and uh, and we'll make these decisions that we appreciate. Uh, uh, Guidance, assistance from the international community—that uh, uh, that, that's okay. But uh, we're making these decisions, and we're making them because they're uh, they're in the interests of, of all of us, et cetera. So I, I think that's the the antidote to it. Uh, um, we know in, in political things you can never <laughs> you can never be sure uh, uh, that, uh, that 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 works uh, all the time. But uh, but but I think that the, the, certainly the, the the best approach. And and obviously we had the attempted comeback and. In 2015, going into the into the general election, and that and that failed, and and uh, I think uh, this is not a question of people looking for some for for a government that they've never had and hoping that it would be somehow uh, make Sri Lanka great again or something. Uh, they already know uh, what they had in the past, and uh, and and they made a decision on that. So I would I would you know I think probably there'll be there'll be new leadership uh, in opposition before long, uh, and. Uh, but these issues will still have to be battled, and as Tisa said, uh, uh, not uh, and never in, in a situation when you're dealing with a minority uh, do you want to make the, <laughs> for it to be a situation of placating the minority. It's it's, it's doing this for the for the good of the whole, uh, is what we're talking about. Are there any more questions? More panelists? All right. Well, that concludes. This briefing for today. And thank you for coming and attending, and hopefully in the future we continue to continue this issue. And you know, as we just keep progressing, that 
Changes are foreseeable. Thank you. I was, going to, I was going to bring up Mr. Mendez. I didn't bring up Cesar Mendez. Right. Yes. 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 Yes.